What's up, everybody? This is Grant at Cause Artist. Welcome to another episode of the Disruptors for Good podcast. Today, we're going to speak with Christian Shear, the CEO and co-founder of Regen Network, on reversing climate change through their software platform that incentivizes carbon removal. And how it works and how you can sort of think about it is that Regen Network is essentially building the app store for climate change technologies, whereas they are building the ecosystem to allow individuals to build uh, on top of their their network and app store, so to speak. And the first app, quote unquote, on the Regen Network uh, platform and app store is their own, which allows verification for farmers and ranchers to get paid essentially for for doing amazing work, right? And and, and doing innovative things that then companies can purchase carbon offsets, right? So for the example we give is, is Delta, right? Delta has, before COVID, they have made a commitment to be carbon neutral. In the future, they want to be 100% carbon neutral, right? Which is a long way to go for airlines, right? But they need a purchase purchase carbon offsets right from somewheres and what regen network does is, is verify the ability for companies to do that right so farmers can you know plant trees or do other things on their land where if if delta or another company wants to offset carbon neutral they will go to these ranchers and farmlands and say hey you know we want to pay you for planting this amount of trees, right? Or this amount of something. It, it kind of depends on, on what their goals are. Um, but it allows this marketplace of, of carbon offset purchases, and it allows a new revenue stream for farmers and ranchers, which traditionally have not had multi, multiple revenue streams, right? It's been, it's, it's very difficult for them sometimes because uh, weather is changing so rapidly that climate change has uh, been destructive to that industry. So we talk a lot about um, his history and, and his relationship with, with sort of farming and, and that community and what that means to the world, really. It's such a massive, massive sector that contributes so much to our society, and we, we really don't think about it too much. But Christian is the CEO and co-founder of Regen Network. Again, it's an ecological agreements platform is how he would talk about it. And it's working to accelerate the adoption of regenerative agriculture. And Christian has been working in ecological agriculture for the past 15 years with much of that time spent working in farmers in Southeast Asia. As the co-founder of Terra Genesis International, he spent five years working with leading natural products brands, helping them understand how to invest in their existing supply systems to encourage them toward more regenerative practices. Christian is, he's pouring his life in, into the Regen Network. I mean, it's uh, its what his life's work is going to be, and we talk a little bit about that. Hope everybody's doing well. Hope I, everybody's having a, a great day and great week. And we'll talk soon. Thanks. Bye. So usually how I like to uh, start these conversations is about an individual's journey. And usually it can be a long and interesting one for, for many people. And it seems like yours has, has been as well. So maybe take us through uh, a little bit of the journey to start the Regen Network. Let's see where to start. <laughs> I, I think that as... I meet different activists and different entrepreneurs and folks that are trying to make positive change in the world. A lot of us arrive at a place where we understand that all of these issues are actually one big, mm, right. complex uh, system, right? And, and it involves you know, racial justice, which is very front of mind for a lot of people right now. It involves environmental justice. It involves the you know, uh, biodiversity. It involves capitalism mm -hmm. and debt. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, any one of those avenues could easily be a place that a person uh, becomes passionate and yep. enters in and then realizes, oh, it's not just about debt. Right. Uh, it's actually turns out that this goes back, you know, to Im imperialism and patriarchy and, you know, all sorts of stuff tie in with this. Yeah. I entered this through, to be honest with you, just through a personal search for, for happiness and fulfillment. Mm hmm which is, which is an interesting way to come, to arrive there. But my family moved to Thailand when I was 12. I went to the International School of Bangkok for middle school and high school. Wow. And then en ended up moving back to Thailand after, after university. And I think there's something about the Thai culture and the Buddhist influence that, that had me recognize that, that my happiness had very little to do with the amount of money I have or the amount of things I have. And that became really clear after living in Thailand for a long time, moving back to the U.S. To be honest with you, just recognizing how much discontent and how much a, a culture of complaint and a culture of 
uh, unsatisfaction there was in the United States. Uh, whereas the Thai people that have so much less, mm. you know, in terms of material goods, um, just seem to be much more satisfied on a day to day basis. You know, they just they just seem to enjoy and they kick back. They like <laughs> they laugh with each other all the time, and they, you know, it just seems more about like, hey, what's happening right now? Right. And so that was a pretty um, interesting awakening to experience that as I land in university and I'm simultaneously being told like, you know, the key to your success is like having this degree and like yeah. getting a really good job. And like, man, that just sounds like a lot of stress. <laughs> 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 I ended up moving back to Thailand and starting an education center in Northern Thailand that mm -hmm. was focused on um, natural building and, and permaculture. For any of the listeners out there that haven't looked into permaculture design, it's, it's an incredible, um, design science that looks at how we can live more in tune with the with the patterns of nature and you know work work with natural systems rather than against natural systems and how do i do that in my backyard garden how right. do i do that um in the way that i design my house how do mm. i do that in the way that i design my communities you know it's really a multifaceted uh, design science uh, and so i we, st we started this education center i started teaching uh, permaculture design and i realized that for my own well-being Having a community of people around me and being involved in things that have real world outcomes was really, really meaningful for my own, for my own heart. And that I can't really be deeply happy unless the people around me are happy as well. That's a great point. And, and soon that grew, I think that that um, uh, like scope of care grew from us just like, I want my friends to be happy to, I need my community to be happy. And I like, actually, I'd like, if possible, if all of us could be doing well, that would be <laughs> That would be great. And, and, and then in, while doing that, obviously I met a lot of smallholder farmers in Northern Thailand, people that have, you know, one acre or two acres of land mm. that they're working and um, just really beautiful people that work really hard and get very, very little in return for their, for their labor, you know, mm. yeah. whether it's, you know, growing, growing rice or growing corn or growing garlic or whatever it was there. And um, those local communities, um, they just, you know, they, they work their, butts off and at the, when the when payday comes it's really not very much and to be honest with you farmers around the world sometimes payday doesn't even pay off what they spent to grow right. that thing depending on the especially these days with climate instability yeah weather is a huge issue right i mean whether yield yeah. it would yield that year or even that that quarter or, or month even right it, it that i mean weather patterns matter just immensely to every really every farmer really wherever you are that's right that's right and and you know the way our economic system is set up the farmers take the risk themselves it's not it's not like we're like we're we're all like well we all eat so why don't we all share the risk with you uh, right you no know, that's that's not how it is it's a it's a dog eat dog world out there and uh, and it's it's hard for farmers and they, they honestly don't get recognized for you know given the fact that most of us eat their things three times a day, it seems like we would have a lot more appreciation for sure. Them. So anyway, you, you're starting to see that I've gained some respect and <laughs> care for, for those uh, farmers and ranchers and you know what I consider to really be the stewards of a huge portion of this of this planet. If you take if you take agriculture and ranching together, it covers about 60% of the land area of the of the planet. Individual people, individual families making decisions about how to manage those those landscapes. And so as I was searching for for my own fulfillment and well-being, and then realizing I wanted my community to be doing well and my and people in general be doing well, uh, I landed on on agriculture as a particularly interesting node of engagement. Mm -hmm. Not only does it relate to to my own nutrition and our nutrition sure. that we get every day, but it relates very heavily. Like I just said, sixty percent of the land area is managed by farmers and ranchers, so it relates hugely to our ecosystem. And every single watershed—I don't know if that's true. There's probably some Siberian watershed. Obscure, right? yeah. <laughs> uh, but the vast majority of watersheds on this planet are severely affected by the way that agriculture is 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 done. And right now, uh, agriculture uses about 70% of all the water resources on the planet that are, that are used by people. Uh, agriculture produces about 20, 25 to 30% of all the fossil fuel uh, emissions of, of human um, production uh, and, you know, is actively degrading the landscape very rapidly. I mean, it's a, it's a really big deal. And we know we have great examples around the world of what we're now calling regenerative agriculture, where farmers, ranchers, 
uh, pastoralists are managing their landscapes in such a way that actually make the landscape healthier over time. Can you give us and some that, some examples, or, or maybe one that you're that's really profound? Uh, sure. Yeah, uh, holistic management of cattle is a great example, and it's a particularly good example because of you know um, these movies that have come out like Cowspiracy and uh, mm -hmm. Forks Over Knives and et cetera that are all saying that you know cows are the are the bane of the earth. And they're not wrong. The vast majority of cattle management is very degradatory to the sure. planet. The idea is you take a bunch of cows, you put them in a, yeah. an enclosed area, and you just leave them there, there for the whole year. And then you come back and harvest. And, and at the end of the year, the land is pretty beat up and degraded. Well, it turns out there, was, there were more bovine animals, which is the type that a cow is, on, in North America before the white man arrived in North America, right? So as the Savory Institute says, it's not the cow, it's the how, <laughs> right? The, the movement of the buffalo across the Great Plains in the United States, and some of this was aided by the, by the uh, human interaction with Native Americans, that movement of the buffalo created the most fertile soil known to man, wow. you know, in Iowa and Nebraska yeah. and Kansas, as yeah. we were just talking about huge, huge, huge amounts of topsoil that were uh, created by the, the massive grazing of these animals that would move through the landscapes, right. eat everything down, trample everything, manure everything, and mm -hmm. then move on, mm -hmm. you know, and they wouldn't return to that same spot for, you know, 60 to 90 days. So what uh, holistic management is doing with, with cattle is trying to mimic those natural processes. Interesting. Yeah. You know? So rather than if you had a hundred cattle and a uh, hundred acres, okay. rather than just fencing in the hundred acres and just letting them be there all year, instead you would put them into a one acre block, all hundred cattle into one acre block, which anecdotally cattle feel more comfortable when they're in tight herds. They feel safer. Right. They're a herding animal. So they actually, you know, and I don't know what the science behind this, but they they feel safer. They feel comfortable being in a in a mob uh, group. And then every single day, you then let them eat down that one acre, and then you move them to the next acre. Huh. Uh, and then you move them to the next acre, and you don't return them until a hundred days later. And and what what has happened here is that they have eaten everything down very very evenly. They've manured the whole area very evenly. They've trampled on those things that they don't like to eat, like thistles and ragweed and other things. And when they return the next time around, the grass is beautiful. And those things that are most nutritious for them and those perennial grasses mm. that, are, that are naturally occurring, prairie, grassland situ situation, are more likely to have returned. Uh, and so what's, what's cool about holistic management is it actually puts more pounds on the animals. So it's an easy sell to, to ranchers. Sure. Like, sure. You're, hey, rancher, you're going to make more money and your land is going to be better off when you, when you pass it to your kids than, than it is now. Right. Which is both of those things are value propositions that a rancher uh, cares about. Right. So that's a great example. of. Uh, and uh, let me give you one more example non in, in the non-animal space, which is uh, agroforestry. Okay. Right. So, so if we're growing cacao, or if we're growing coffee, or we're growing uh, palm oil, which is a big deal right so now. So ma massive industries, <laughs> very yeah, massive industries. Yeah, totally massive industries. Uh, there, are, there's two ways to go about that. One is to just clear the area, try to create uh, a just clear and flat and easy to manage landscape, and you only plant one species into it, and that's just like a coffee orchard or right, a right. palm oil orchard. The other way is to try to understand how do these natural forest systems, you know, thrive for millions of years. You know, when nobody ever needed to add any right. fertilizer to them, nobody mm -hmm. ever needed to spray Roundup to control right. the weeds, and they they support so many species and create so much fertility. How can we utilize the natural processes of these of these ecologies to grow our cacao and our coffee and our palm and other things in a way that's much more environmentally friendly? And uh, it's totally possible. It's a little bit more complex, right? Yeah. So it's easier for the human mind to kind of create a petri dish of a site, basically kill everything and then plant one species. And then if anything else tries to come, just like spray it with Roundup. Right. But that mentality is not only arguably less profitable for the farmer, it's also definitely a lot less profitable for the planet. But it's it, the one thing that I've, I've sort of read 
a little bit just from the the, the little farm reading that I have done over the years mm -hmm. is yeah. that a lot of these farmers and ranchers sell their land right to sort of these these big companies because I, I guess one they just they don't want to deal with anymore. Maybe like it's not profitable for them anymore, or the offer is just too good. But is that is mm -hmm. that an issue where a lot of the land, like you said, sixty percent are owned by is, is farmland and sort of ranch land? Is that mm -hmm. still owned by the actual farmers, right, or the families, like you said, or is a lot of this land owned by these companies, right, which then becomes a totally different dynamic, right? And I imagine that's more. It might be in some regions. It might be. You know, companies might own more land than in other regions. It's still sort of family owned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's totally the trend. There's this this idea: go big or get out mm -hmm. in uh, mm -hmm. in agriculture, and that that completely goes down the mindset and approach of of big agriculture, mm -hmm. of kind of smart agriculture, of efficient agriculture, where we're just going to try to do it a little bit better each year. We're going to get bigger combines and fly drones for all of our data, and we're going to like yeah. You use uh, precision ag uh, practices to just try to eke out a few more dollars per acre. And when you're growing soy or corn or wheat or you know these things, the approach, especially in the United States, is is that approach. If we can get an, an extra two dollars per acre, mm -hmm. and we have ten thousand acres, that's really helpful for our for our bottom line. It's a different it's a different approach. Okay, first of all, to answer your question, uh, that is a that is a trend. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Still is the case that that the vast majority of farmland in the world and even in this country are privately owned. Now, especially in this country, the the average size of a farm has gone up a lot. But mm. even those the people that are buying up those farms generally are local farmers who have somehow just gotten ahead and are able gotcha. to buy it buy it from their neighbors and expand out. It's not like uh, Monsanto or John Deere or any of these companies have like you know bought up millions and millions of acres to mm -hmm. grow the grow the soy. Uh, yeah, now let, I guess let's talk a little bit about what actual Regen Network is, right? Because you know, as we, mm -hmm. were, we were talking before briefly, there is I mean, you're trying to build something pretty big, <laughs> you know, and it's uh, that's going to take a lot of effort from a lot of people, right? Maybe mm -hmm. a, a lot of financing as well, but also like a lot of people to like believe in it, right? And get on board. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I guess talk a little bit about what Regen is a, as a company, right? And maybe how that got started and that, I think it went through Techstars, right? Is that is that kind of the, the formation yeah. of everything? Uh, yeah, we did go through Techstars program. Uh, that was, we were already a year and a half into our company. So gotcha. uh, a lot had been developed by then. But yeah, just to, to to back up a second, um, Regen Network, I mean, we're aiming to uh, do our part to reverse global climate change, specifically through the intervention node of, of agriculture and ranching, and, and but land management in general, including conservation. So in, like in Techstars, we worked with the Nature Conservancy, for example. We are building, we are a software technology company. We're building a full stack of technology that, that brings trust, transparency, openness, community governance to ecological data. The idea is to put these tools and to put access to that data into the common. And that, that concept is really important because management of the commons is something that our world uh, needs to get a lot better at, mm -hmm. you know? And when I, when I say the commons, I mean, the atmosphere is a, is a great example of the common. It's not something that any one company or one country has dominion over. Right. We all share it. We all benefit from it. And we all potentially have adverse effects from the client from the from our atmosphere and from climate. And so as as we as an international community are thinking about how to manage the atmosphere in a commons way, we need access to data and information and knowledge that we can trust and is held in a manner that is managed by a community of stakeholders that that are arguably a lot less biased and and uh, self-serving than uh, <laughs> than, a, than a centralized organization. Yeah. Right. Up until now, it's been really useful to use governments or intergovernmental organizations or, or nonprofit organizations as our like trusted entity. Right. Like uh, if the EPA says it's true, then it's probably yeah. true. <laughs> I, I'm guessing there's a lot of people on this call that might not trust the EPA. Yeah, the way they, they for sure. Uh, um, so we need we need another type of environmental organization that's not a centralized organization that has uh, its own agenda. And that's where building a, a full stack software development kit that is governed uh, by a community of governors. And anyone can get involved in that governance is essential. 
so that it involves... could be it could be useful for the EPA, right? I mean, eventually, I mean, it could totally. be something they totally. they actually go to to make better decisions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the ultimate um, dream of this uh, full stack of infrastructure is that it becomes ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. That it's like, oh wow, like the, obviously we would log transactions and we would run data through here so that everyone knows that this happened at this time in this ecological space, and that can't be, um, you know, that can't be disputed. It's, yeah, it's got a timestamp. It's got it's got immutability. Um, how do you, how do you so, how do you grab all this data? What's sort of the the process of doing that? Because I mean that's obviously huge. I mean getting all this data from all these different avenues that sort right. of takes a lot of different instruments working together to to pull that in and obviously be trustworthy and things like that. Totally. And so so one of the, it's easy to imagine the the kind of like NASA like uh, yeah. <laughs> like room with all the data and all the information and you know maybe we'll get there eventually uh, i mean there is so much possible ecological data that's that could be streamed at any given moment it's absolutely overwhelming you know even just like um you know uh, surfing around on google earth is, is sure. incredibly fascinating and there's no way that you could you know, even if you spent years zooming in on places, there's no way you could actually get a full understanding of what's going on on this planet. So we as a company are not setting out to be the centralized source of data, right? In fact, that would undermine everything that I was just saying. Mm -hmm. The idea is that we're building infrastructure that allows streams of data to be fed into our site and to be to be verified and to be timestamped and be put somewhere where they're immutable and people can trust that that data was actually what it was when it was when it arrived. Nobody has manipulated, right? So you know those streams of data are you know satellite imagery data. They are IoT devices on the ground, et cetera. And and to be honest, at where we're at right now is that we've launched one application that has that has very particular and finite needs for data. And that application is working on is the issuance of ecosystem services credits, like right. carbon credits. We, this was uh, interesting. Let's go through that example, because I thought mm -hmm. it was well well defined the way, the way you talked about the carbon credit and how that's purchased by companies to offset carbon emissions. Yeah. So I, if you want to go through that example, I think it was just, it was just really well said. Yeah, great. So um, the, 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 the decentralized uh, community governed infrastructure that we're building has so many different applications that are possible. Right? And we're building it in such a way that many, many different things can be built on top of it. In fact, I was using the um, analogy that it's kind of like building the technology for the Play Store. Yep. And then it, it, it builds in such a way that many, many different things can be added on and built onto the place. And to the point where you just have so many different potentials. Yeah. yeah. And then we're building the first application that's going onto the place, though, right? We're building what, we, what we're calling a, um, a registry, a credit registry. It, it can issue carbon credits, biodiversity credits, water quality credits, et cetera, in, into the voluntary markets. So what does, that, what does that mean and how does that look? We've issued our first credits associated with a 1,800 hectare ranch in New South Wales, New South Wales, Australia, uh, a farm called Wilmot Farm that's doing that's practicing hol holistic management of cattle. They have increased their soil organic matter from 2% soil organic carbon to 4.5% uh, carbon, which is a huge increase. Their their site is amazing. They act as an education center. A lot of other wow. farmers and ranchers come there to like learn from them about how they're managing their landscapes. And so we're super proud to be teaming up with them on this. And what we've done is we've created a, a remote sensing methodology to be able to verify the carbon in the soil. Uh, we've reduced, you know, they still take soil samples on site, mm -hmm. but it's about, a, it's about an order of magnitude less soil samples than some other methodologies would require. And then we're using satellite imagery to correlate the data that we're getting from the ground to the rest of the site. Basically, in essence, taking you know ten thousand virtual samples across mm. the entire landscape, gotcha. so we get it. We get a very nuanced understanding of where the soil carbon is and where it's not, and where it has increased year over year and where it hasn't. In addition to that, we're we're using a methodology to verify animal welfare, uh, to verify a, a soil health in other ways besides the carbon, and to to be uh, monitoring ecosystem health in general. We take the verification of those four things. And we bundle it into a digital asset, which then can then be uh, used as a as an ecological offset for corporations, individuals, NGOs, et cetera. And the idea is that 
companies can buy these credits to offset, like let's just say Delta, right? Obviously they, mm -hmm. <laughs> they emit a lot of carbon, just, just their natural business, yep. right? It, is, it, it just does that. And then they can purchase these credits to offset what they're putting out there. And then that's how we talked about is that this is a, a different sort of revenue stream for farmers and ranchers that just never existed before, right? So now, you know, maybe, right. maybe they're not, you know, the, because of the weather patterns and because of, of sort of climate change at this moment in time, that, you know, they don't have the traditional yield they have, or, or frankly, they just don't, they're just not making enough money to even stay solvent, right? And this is an alternative way maybe for them to stay, stay alive, right? Essentially as, uh, yeah. as, a, as a family farm or a business themselves. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So, you know, basically every farmer that I've ever met sees themselves as a, as a steward of the land. You know, right. they, they take a lot of care. Yeah. Uh, that, and that's true of conventional farmers and ecological farmers. That, you know, they work really hard and do a lot of things to take care of their landscapes. Now, of course, all of them could be doing it better and there's ways that they could grow their capacity. But the, the point here is that they produce corn or they produce beef or they produce mangoes, whatever it is, that is a commodity that's really easy and clear for us to understand. Right. Is value, the value right. that's created for all of us. It goes to the market, they then sell it and they get yeah. dollars. Well, what we're saying here is that farmers also produce other value. They sequester carbon out of the atmosphere if they're practicing the right practice. They infiltrate water back into the aquifers. They create clean water outcomes into the streams and rivers. They create habitat for birds and deer and reptiles and, you know, if they have the, the right practices. So what Regen Network is offering to these farmers and ranchers is the opportunity to create uh, digital assets that they are able to turn into into financial uh, income. So they can bring their mangoes, they can bring their potatoes to market, but they can also bring their clean water and their their carbon. It's to pretty. Yeah, it's it's basically being paid to be innovative, right? Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, and, that's a. Uh, I mean, because I, I'm just imagining like uh, you know you or or somebody else would be company like talking to like a rancher right in Iowa or something like that. Like, what yeah. are those conversations like? Like, when you speak to them about like do they immediately dismiss it? Are they very responsive? Like, what are these conversations actually like with sure. the ranchers and, and the farmers that you're, you're sort of selling an idea to, but informing them on what's possible, I guess, for their land? Yeah, I mean, farmers and ranchers are rightfully so very skeptical about sure. things like that. I yeah. mean, they have been, they've been told all sorts of things, <laughs> and, you know, over, over the last multiple generations of how, we're, you know, this outside party is going to come in and we're right. going to help you and you should do it this way. And, you know, and the vast majority of those schemes didn't really work out for them. Mm -hmm. In fact, what, what usually happens to the farmers is that there's like, hey, we want to encourage you to use less nitrates and we're going to reward you. And that happens for a couple of years. And then the government just passes a law saying that they have to do that and they don't get mm -hmm. anything for it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's been a really common pattern for farmers that they, they get just manipulated by the system. And environmental rules generally hurt them. Right. It, hurts, it hurts their bottom line. Right. And, you know, that's just not going to work in the long term. We need a thriving and, and engaged farming and ranching community. Yeah. That that is that is recognized for the stewardship that they do of the landscape, that is appreciated for the value that they bring to all of us. Yeah, this is one thing that's for me is a side benefit of all this, is that as of right now, we generally see farmers and ranchers basically as as like peasants, as like third class citizens. Like a lot of people feel sorry, oh, oh wow, you're a farmer. That like that must kind of suck, you know? Mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. Well, dude, you eat three times a day. This this person is providing, literally providing health and vitality for you and your family. You know, from my perspective, we should be holding them in a similar way that we hold doctors. It's a great <laughs> point. I just think, I think, look, people, there's not a lot of people that live in modern cities that know farmers, right? Or know yeah. what it takes to even do that kind of thing. It's a very sort of close knit network of skilled individuals that, you know, right. it just doesn't translate to the outside world yeah. that well right because it is like like a doc like you can't just walk in and go be like a doctor right i mean obviously it takes a decade sure. of sort of education same thing with farming right you can't just like go to a farm one day and learn how to do it at a really skilled level right it'd probably take you a, a decade right. right to really to really learn that skill and craft it whereas that's, that's whereas exactly different right. yeah whereas different parts of society you could sort of learn it in six months right you can learn yeah. javascript in six months if you really wanted to right totally. And, totally. and so 
and so I think, like you said before, as farming and, and ranches, it's, it's, it's really this interesting thing because it, it sort of gets passed down, right, mm-hmm. to generation to generation. And I think that maybe the younger generation, and I'm hoping this, right, is that they want to take that responsibility on, right? And having these tools, right, and these innovative approaches to do so might attract the younger generation to, to go the route. Of, of taking that baton, so to speak, and, and carrying on, you know, that land in a way that their ancestors did. Um, mm. And I, th- in that way, we don't, we still have this sort of independent land ownership rather than, you know, a, a farmer or rancher saying, hey, you know, my children are not interested, right, in doing this, or like, I, I don't have anybody to pass it down to, I'm just gonna have to sell it to, mm-hmm. you know, maybe a, a corporation or, or somebody who maybe won't retain the, mm-hmm. the value that, that they have done for so long. So. I'm hoping technologies like this and innovations like this, like almost breed a new generation of ranchers and farmers, right? Do, mm-hmm. Would you see that happening? Could you see that happening? Absolutely. I mean, I think what we're bouncing around here is, is the, the need for both intrinsic and, and extrinsic motivation on the part of, of our farming communities to be doing what they're doing. And, and the extrinsic motivation from our perspective is financial motivation. Right. You know, so saying, you know, what you're doing is producing something of value to all the rest of us, sequestering carbon, creating clean water, you know, supporting our habitats. That is something of value to the, right. to the, the international community right now. We need to put a price on that and, mm-hmm. and be able to reward these folks. Um, there already is a price on carbon. There is a carbon market. Yep. Uh, unfortunately, the barriers to entry for that are very high. It's very expensive to verify uh, yourself. And so one of the ways that Regen Network is innovating is reducing the, the is innovating in methodology to reduce the cost of, of uh, entrance. Into, That's interesting. Yeah. You know, there's 400 million farmers around the planet. You know, <laughs> if, we, if we can get them involved, not only are we helping those individual families to um, make their ends meet, but we're revitalizing rural economies and bringing, uh, bringing health back to, the, back to the planet in that way. Now, the, the intrinsic motivation side of this is is another really interesting piece here you know and this goes to what we were just talking about being recognized i think what you were just saying about someone living in a city has no transparency has no has feels no connection with the 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 source of their food right and so uh, as we're building this ecological data infrastructure that is that is trusted and is transparent and community governed and what one of our aims here is to give is to democratize the access to this information so that not not only an individual can click in and actually look at the raw data itself, but that other people can build apps and, and right. applications that can help you feel connected so that perhaps when you sit down to lunch, there's some way that there could be a little mm. uh, reminder of the connection of where this lunch came from. Interesting. You know? Yeah. Uh, and and that starts a a reconnection for all of us right. uh, uh, to our food, to those landscapes, to those stewards of those landscapes, and then we start to appreciate them more. And then, and then when people are appreciated, uh, that in and of itself is a huge um, motivation for 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 taking action. I want to talk a little bit about. <laughs> it's probably the wrong term, right? But like, sort of the sales process, right? Like. Is it somebody literally just walking up to like a ranch's door, like knocking, sitting there, there and talking to them? How right now is Regen like getting ranchers on board, right, to do mm-hmm. this? So, yeah, so this, this is an interesting thing. There's, <laughs> this, there's a two-sided marketplace, right? On the one hand, we have farmers and ranchers who are providing ecological impact and producing these uh, carbon credits and other yeah. credits. On the other hand, we've got purchasers of these impacts, that's corporations, individuals, governments that want to be supporting ecological impact and offsetting their negative emissions. So almost you need the corporations first, right? Because then it's easy to sell the ranchers on it. Yeah. In most marketplaces, you do have a limiting side of the equation. Yeah. In our place, the limiting side is clearly the corporate uh, <laughs> buyers. Though it's not that limited. I mean, the the market for carbon credits is a, is a multi, multi-billion dollar market at this point. Mm-hmm. And the last few years have seen a huge rise in the purchase of voluntary carbon credits. So just to speak to Regen Network in particular, uh, we when we were in Techstars, you know, demo day was coming up. We're going to give this presentation <laughs> on our platform. And we're like, we should run a little, we should put this, the the call out there to all of our networks and see if we, you know, see if we could get 100,000 acres uh, committed to, um, you know, interested 
signed up that wants to participate in this in this platform. And we're like, okay, we got three weeks to do this. Like, let's shoot for a hundred thousand acres. We got five point three million acres oh my God. Of, of farming and ranching land signed up on our platform. So the farming and ranching community definitely wants to be paid for ecological impact. Wow. They want to be they want to be verified. They want to be uh, proven that what they're doing is really offering value and then getting recognized and paid for that. So that side is is well taken care of. I mean, sure. Yeah, we have a lot of people and a lot of farmers that want to participate. That's great. Now, there are, you know, depends on what list you look at. There's uh, nature based, uh, uh, science based solutions or science based targets. There are, you know, the, the Paris Climate Agreement. There's a whole bunch of various different agreements with the SDGs and others that corporations can make public announcements of the fact that they want to head towards carbon neutrality. And that they're going to be buying carbon offsets to to move themselves towards towards that. And you mentioned Delta Airlines. You know, right now is a pretty tough time for them during COVID sure. and the economic downturn. But yeah. just prior to that, at the beginning of this year, they announced that they want to become a carbon neutral airline. Yeah, they're going to buy. They're going to voluntarily buy carbon credits to offset all of the carbon that they produce every single year. Hopefully, they Starting, can. Af- hopefully, they can afford it now, though. I know. <laughs> I, I, I just, yeah, I, I sure hope they continue with that program. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, obviously, that is a huge amount of carbon. Uh, oh yeah. Credit. I mean, that, and, well, once somebody like that does it right, it, it's the other airlines have to probably fall in line, right? So that's the domino effect of somebody that big and influential yeah. in the industry doing it. It's sort of like you've seen with this, these no fee trading platforms now, like uh, Robinhood mm-hmm. releases no fees on, on tradings now. Charles right. Schwab does it, Fidelity, like all these massive, massive institution, financial institutions now have to have to cater to this, this startup that, that sort of yeah. you know, made this little, this little tweak. And now this, I mean, massive industry change has happened. And, and hopefully, you know, Delta and obviously other industry leaders uh, make a, a commitment like that will then force obviously other their competitors, so to speak, to, to do the that's, same. That's right. I mean, the key is, I mean, the, the, the key connector there is if people will patronize them more because of that, because of that choice. Yeah. So, you know, so if you're, if you're like, ah, oh, there's like a, an American airline versus Delta airline, basically the same price, same thing, yeah. like which, which one are you going to choose? I, w- I would suggest you should go towards Delta because they are committed to offsetting their carbon, you know, and, and I don't know the insides of Delta and all the other of course, features yeah. that maybe would make you choose a different airline. But, you know, like Lyft and Uber, for example, right. Lyft, Lyft right. offsets all their carbon. Uber does not. Mm-hmm. I, I personally will ride Lyft every single time instead of right. Uber right. because of that. I want to go back to, to what you said, uh, where well, you ate for 100,000 acres, but then you got five over 5 million. Was uh-huh. that like, what went into that, those three weeks, right? Was it, I mean, just cold email outreach? Like, was it like ads, like how did, how did that happen? Yeah. Well, fortunately my co-founder and I both come from an ecological agriculture background. Okay. You know, we've, he's been working in central and South America a lot. Uh, I was working in Southeast Asia and then both of us were working with natural products companies, you know, okay. companies with huge supply chains and all, you know, farmers around, all around the world. So uh, honestly, it actually wasn't that difficult for us to, to blast out a newsletter to our followers. To, Amazing. To, to, send a shout out to particular folks and um, pretty rapidly have a response like that. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm really, really grateful for that. I wanted to go back to the uh, corporation thing for a second. Because sure. One of the big criticisms that people uh, give of our platform is they're like, you know, carbon offsets. Are you basically just saying that you're okay with a company, um, you know, emitting mm. as much as they want, as long as they offset their carbon? Doesn't that seem like a cop out? Couldn't like Delta Airlines and Microsoft and others actually be trying to reduce their carbon footprint sure. uh, rather than just offsetting it? Mm-hmm. And here's the deal with it. Here's the deal of what carbon offsets does is once a company like Lyft, Lyft is a great example here. Once they have written it into their business plan that they have to buy carbon offsets as part of doing business, then they have their CFO on board saying, look, people, we need to reduce our carbon footprint because if we don't, we have to buy all these uh, expensive carbon <laughs> offsets. So then it's like, now you've got your CFO on your board. Yeah. It's not just your, your chief sustainability officer. Mm, it's like, that's huge. It's like, a big shift. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, Frank. Right. Yeah, like, right. Yeah. Sustainability. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But when your CFO is uh, is saying it, it's, it comes, that's it interesting. tends that's to interesting. come with a little bit more weight. 
And so like Lyft, for example, um, if they can get people to take shared rides instead of individual rides, or they right. can get people to ride little scooters instead of cars, it means that they've still gotten people miles, which is one of their aims as a company, is how many miles can we move people? Sure. But they've used less, they've emitted less carbon in the process. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so it, it, it helps shift. And actually, Delta Airlines as well is investing into biofuels. You know, sure. obviously they, they can't cover their whole. I mean, yeah, I mean, some of the stuff's just not viable for some businesses yet, right? I mean, technology is just not there yet to make an yeah. airline sort of like, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. just it's just not there yet, right? I mean, until Tesla builds planes, right? Or until, <laughs> right. until Boeing starts to create electric you know planes i mean it's just it's just not going to be there yet for industries like that but yeah. for for other industries i mean it's absolutely certainly possible um to yeah. build that into into their to their business model and business plan and i think that's a a great point you make because i think it's it's a good question by those people who who talk about that right who say that question right but then it's it's also a great answer by you right it's like well this this makes people look at it differently i think which is interesting when you get the cfo involved Mm -hmm. then, then you really start to make some moves within a company, right? When he, it's uh, it's That's much right. different when he speaks, he or she yeah. speaks. So the last question uh, I like to end on is usually the future. And, you know, it, it's it's a weird time right now. But I think as we look, you know, five years down down the road for, for you guys, I guess, what are some of the goals and what are some of the, the missions and maybe, you know, you guys as North Star or what you want to, you know, succeed in, 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 let's say, the next decade? Yeah. So again, there's the, the two layers of this, and I'll start with the registry side of it, the, the, the credit side of it. We would love to see it easily accessible to any consumer That's the, the, that they can easily go on to any corporation's web, web page and click on a link and have a clear portfolio of mm -hmm. all the ecological offsets that that company has purchased. You know, and our technology using uh, distributed ledger technology makes that very, very, very easy. And you can even click into each of those and understand where and how that uh, ecological impact was created. So you can judge for yourself of whether it has any merit or not. Mm -hmm. You don't have to take the corporation's uh, word for it. You don't have to take the USDA's word for it. You don't have to take some certification agency's word for it. You don't have to take Regen Network's word mm -hmm. for it. Right. It's, it's there on a distributed open ledger. That is incredibly powering, empowering and gives us agency to be able to make our decisions in line with our ethics. And personally, I believe that human beings are ethical beings. And if we could have transparency into the effects of our actions, we would take actions that benefit. Yeah, agree. Not degrade. So that's, that's one of the big aims there. And on the decentralized tools side of things, we ex basically extend that same idea to all sorts of different applications, all sorts of ecological applications. So just being able to crowdsource and uh, get citizen science involved in the rehabilitation of some frog habitat or something. Like, uh -huh. How do you do that in a way that uh, you know, can bring people together in an in a open and transparent and shared way? You know? And I don't, you know, I don't know the answer to that. But I believe that the tools that we're building, giving people a data infrastructure that helps them share things in an open and transparent way, helps them uh, map things in a way that uh, can be trusted, um, helps them engage and to be able to record that engagement in a way that's shared and trusted would result in all sorts of applications, including this uh, amphibian rehabilitation effort. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I appreciate it so much, Christian. I think it's uh, it's really just an interesting way to look at an element of society like it's just not talked about really that much, right? We only hear of, of sort of farmers when you know there's a big drought, right, or there's a big storm, and 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 then we hear that there's a food shortage and, and farmers are struggling. It's like it's never really good information, mm -hmm. right? When we hear about these sort of, sort of just the, the ranching and farming sector, it's always uh, really bad things happening to them. Right. It seems yeah. like they're always getting body blow after body blow. It's like they're just right. trying to hang on and survive. But, you know, it, it seems like innovation in the space is it, it's just ripe for, for it to happen. Right. I mean, if there's so many spaces that are being innovated right now. And, mm -hmm. you know, like you said, agriculture is at ad, ad tech in general. Right. It's such a it's such a massive, massive field that a lot a lot of stuff's going into. Right. I mean, a lot of money is being sort of poured into a bunch of different technologies and you know, trying mm -hmm. to, to do different things with, within that sector, some good, some bad, right? But I think, look, I, I think innovating in a way like this, where you have a two-sided marketplace is interesting. 
the ability for for companies to purchase you know carbon offsets but then also a different revenue stream for farmers to me and ranchers is the most innovative approach in this whole yeah. thing right and that, I, I would imagine that perks their ears up too right it's like wait i can get paid to do good things right that's yeah. like a totally different mantra and philosophy that one like just we have as a society and like even too like capitalism has right that's usually not ingrained mm -hmm. in sort of capitalistic philosophy it, is, is being paid for doing good. It's more being paid for just being like ruthless, right? And, and yielding every single dollar you can. So I think hopefully part of all this is, is what I'm doing. And I think what cause artists do is trying to like innovate capitalism in a way of how we all could get paid for doing good things, right? Doing things better to where we all can benefit, like you said, from, from earth, man, you know, I mean, yeah. it's just almost that simple. So appreciate your time and, and everything you guys are doing and, and, and say uh, thanks to the team and, and keep it going. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. And for all the listeners out there, you know, lean in, connect with your farmers, you know, visit your farm, your local farmer's market, uh, support good food. It's good for your body. It's good for the planet. And if you or a company you work with is interested in ecological offsets, definitely, uh, definitely reach out. I'd